Welcome to Apologetics from the Attic, the show that seeks to teach and defend the Christian faith in a post-Christian culture. And now, broadcasting from an attic in an undisclosed location somewhere outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Dave Lewis. Hey everyone, welcome to Apologetics from the Attic. Dave Lewis here. So this episode, and it's going to be a multi-part series, and I know I'm terrible at saying I'm going to do a multi-part series and I never end up doing them, but we're going to do a series entitled The Four Views of Salvation, and we're going to discuss the matter of Pelagianism, Semi-Pelagianism, Semi-Augustinianism, and Augustinianism. And I want to put this together because I want to take a step back if you live online like I do and you know about hashtag Bailgate and the, the fight between Calvinists and provisionists and Calvinists and Pelagians and Calvinists and non-Calvinists, open theists, whatever, the, the battle that goes on. And instead of this being polemical, I just want to step back and I want to just study the issues objectively, as objectively as we can. And in order to do that for our guide, we're going to use an actually you know, a Wesleyan. So that right there, uh, pulling it up now if you're watching. So this is actually a journal article. And you can access it. Uh, the link is there. I'll post this link in the show notes, in the podcast notes. But the author is Christopher T. Bounds, and the source is... Wesley and Methodist Studies, 2011, Volume 3. Now, you can access this online. It costs money. I was able to access it because they were, they were given that free uh, access during COVID. So I was like, yeah, I got a bunch of articles. Anyway, so the, the title of this, so this is going to be our guide. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this. And that's why it's gonna, probably going to take multi-parts. I want to make it more like 45 minutes for each section instead of super long. Um, but... The, the title is, How Are People Saved? The Major Views of Salvation with a Focus on Wesleyan Perspectives and Their Implications. So there is a lot in here where if you're not a Wesleyan, Arminian, classical Arminian, sometimes they're called or Wesleyan Arminians, there's some of this you want to understand. But what, what ends up coming out is the Wesleyan Arminians are actually closer to Calvinists on some of the matters that, res, that relate to this issue. Um, and this first paragraph is good, so let's just jump right in. In Christianity, there are few doctrines more important than salvation. John Wesley's declaration, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, expresses the sentiment of many Christians and God-seekers. Of course, the idea of salvation raises two intimately related questions. What is salvation and how are people saved? Okay. So let's skip down here. He quotes some Wesley. Um so he's gonna. Here's the purpose of the article. The purpose of this article is to examine the different ways Wesleyan theology has answered this question within a larger context of Christianity, and explore the practical implications. Okay. More specifically, I will construct a theological spectrum of Christian perspectives on how people experience salvation, with a focus on naming and describing the various Wesleyan positions. Well, some. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. So let's just jump right in. Okay. Theological spectrum of salvation. Okay. So let's start. Four major views. Okay, so if you're watching the four major views. Now what we're going to do is the reason it's going to take a little longer is we're going to read some primary sources. We're going to read some historical sources that um, Christopher quotes. Is that his name Christopher? I already forgot his name. I forget people's name. I want to, I'm going to say is if I'm going over his article, I want to make sure I got his name right. Yeah, Christopher Bounds. Okay. So we're going to, because he, he does, uh, as a good journal article should, right? He does a lot of citations. So we want to chase down the citations. And, you know, he's taking me down some interesting paths, I have to admit. So let's, let, let's just jump right in here and read this part. Now, the four major views of salvation on the spectrum is this first section. So let's take a look. To begin, there are four major views in Christianity of how people experience salvation, Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, semi-Augustinianism, and Augustinianism. So let's just pause right there. So if you're taking notes and you want to really deeply study this, those are your four categories that he's listing as the spectrum. And he's going to have an actual chart here in a moment. Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, semi-Augustinianism, and Augustinianism. While there are basic defining features of each perspective, they are not monolithic. 
When expressed concretely, they are stated and nuanced in slightly different ways. For example, semi-Pelagians may vary in particular points of their teaching and still be solidly semi-Pelagian, which is true. <coughs> so this, these are never straightforward issues. And then many times you will meet people online especially who, and don't, don't mishear me, I'm not saying you don't, is it's possible to not know what you're doing just because you, you have to go to seminary first and, and you have a Bible degree or whatever. But many people have not thought through this. I've, I've found so many people since I've done this online thing, they're actually thinking through their theology in real time online before they actually go live with an opinion, which you know isn't necessarily the wisest thing to do. But anyway, there's a lot of nuances to this issue, so just remember that. Perhaps the best, back to the article, perhaps the best way to look at these four views on salvation is to see them in a spectrum of thought with their particular position determined by how they handle two fundamental and intimately related doctrines. One, that this is important, pay attention here. He's exactly right about this. What are the two issues that you have to examine that takes you down whatever path you're going to go in one of these four options? One, original sin or human depravity. So that, what you say about original sin is huge and how that affects human depravity. So in other words, Adam's sin, how does Adam's sin affect those born of him? And what does it do to our mind, to our will, to our desires? So that's the first one. The first is human original sin and depravity. So that do, how you treat that, that doctrine really determines what happens in this issue. And number two, the relationship between divine grace and human effort. Huge. Right? This, this, this really solidifies the issue. So the relationship between divine grace and human effort. So God's role and our role in salvation. The first addresses the degree to which original sin influences humanity. To what extent has humanity been damaged by the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden? Good question, right? Very important question. It's a good starter question. When you're dealing with someone, you may not see eye to eye on this issue. Well, what what is your belief? What extent has humanity been damaged by the fall? Right. The set and, and I'm and I just want to true confessions. I'm really trying hard, as I talk, to not stop and be polemical and and well, this guy views says this and this guy online says this. So it's 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 it, the 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 it, it, online is toxic. It really is. It 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 forms your soul in such a way where you're always being polemical and always comparing your position to somebody else's. It's just not healthy. So that's why this is a good exercise for me. Let's just talk about what this says in broad categories and not name anybody. If the shoe fits, wear it as you're listening to this or you think of somebody. Now, the second issue, right, examines the roles God and humanity play in salvation. Is salvation entirely the work of God, entirely the effort of humanity, or some type of divine human divine human divine synergism. Okay, and there's the word. Now, I know many people have said, well, synergism is a word invented later. It's not in the Bible. Well, when we study theology, we have to label things somehow. And that's how he's going to label it this, in this article, so that's what we're going to use. So is salvation entirely a work of God, entirely an effort of humanity, or some type of divine human, human divine synergism. Now he, you're going to see. So there's the that's the spectrum. He'll he'll lay out the spectrum visibly. But the one end of the spectrum is a, is is a salvation entirely the work of God. On the other is it entirely the effort of humanity or some type of divine human divine synergism. Now I I know he uses the word salvation here. I prefer to use the word regeneration, the new birth. Because it, it focuses it more. Salvation is too broad of a term, but we'll use it. It's fine. Now, on one end of the spectrum is the Pelagian view. Okay, so now he's going to describe these views, and then he's going to get deeper into them later. On one end of the spectrum is the Pelagian view. Pelagians deny the doctrine of original sin and see salvation essentially as a human monergism. Now, this, this part of the article was unique. You, know, you don't usually hear that in this debate. Oh, well, you believe in human monergism. Now, if you're a Calvinist and more reformed, you'll be accused, well, you're a, this monergism, I don't agree with it, or you might say, use that to label yourself, which is good to label, that's a good, I think synergism and monergism is a very helpful category distinction when this debate is happening. But it's interesting. Well, you believe in human monergism if you're on the Pelagian spectrum. That's what he's saying here on, the, on, the, on that end of the spectrum. 
So it, it's salvation is essentially human monergism, entirely the work of humanity on the other end of the spectrum. So that's Pelagianism. That's the one extreme end. The, what's the other extreme end, the other end of the pole? On the other end of the spectrum is Augustinianism, which defines original sin as so extensive that humanity has nothing to contribute to the work of salvation. Therefore, Augustinians see salvation as divine monergism, entirely the work of God, right? So that's the spectrum. In the middle are different synergisms of God and humanity working in cooperation with one another. Okay, so now if you're watching on YouTube, uh, if you're listening to the podcast, I'll try to explain it to you, but if you're watching on YouTube, I have on the screen now his actual picture, uh, figure one, Christian views of salvation. Here's his picture of the, the grid, which is very helpful, okay? So synergisms closer to the human monogism side of the spectrum, like semi-plagiism, praise semi-plagiism, place greater emphasis on what humans contribute to salvation while those closer to the divine monergism side, like semi-Augustinianism, place their focus on divine action. I will begin this examination at one end of the spectrum, Pelagianism, and work toward the other end, Augustinianism. So if you're listening, there's a rectangle in front of us, and on one, on the bottom left corner of the rectangle, there's a black dot It says Pelagianism. On the top right corner of the, the, the rectangle, all the way to the other sides, it says Augustinianism. And then there is, it, the, the line goes up and connects the two corners of the uh, rectangle. And then the, the one next on the left says semi-Pelagianism, then semi-Augustinianism, then Augustinianism. And the left side re represents human work, and the right side represents divine work. And then the spectrum label at the bottom, human monergism is on the left, which represents Pelagianism. Divine monergism is on the right, that represents Augustinianism. And then all forms of synergism fall somewhere in the middle. So this is, let's just pause here. This is the framework, broadly speaking, in broad brushes, that in church history, as this debate has went back and forth, started, and the reason it's labeled this way Augustinianism and Pelagianism, if you're not aware, I, I'm, I'll assume that you don't know anything about this. Uh, these are the two characters in church history that had this debate actually in history, Augustine of Hippo and Pelagius. And they articulated this, and this is what happens in church history. Uh, a doctrine is not fully articulated until there's some type of debate about it some type of issue going on where it has to be addressed. And Pelagius came out teaching these things, and Augustine, his opponent, said, you are wrong, and the church ended up siding with Augustine over Pelagius. So we'll talk about that, because we'll actually get into that probably. Yeah, we will. Okay. So now we're going to talk about Pelagianism. Okay. And what we're going to do, well, let me read this first paragraph here, and then I'll tell you what the next thing we're going to do here is. So now we're talking about Pelagianism, after we've looked at his broad brush overview. Okay. So Pelagianism is on the one extreme, remember. Pelagianism. Pelagianism expresses the strongest form of human monergism. Okay. Now, monergism and synergism, what do those mean? Mono means one, right? Sin, S-Y-N, means more than one. Okay. Monergism. So, and then ergos is work or worker or energy or power. So mono ergos, monergism, means one worker, one power. Synergism means two workers or two powers. Okay, just so we could define our terms. So Pelagianism here, according to Christopher, expresses the strongest form of human monergism. So on a human side, there's one worker or one power. Because Pelagians reject the idea of original sin, they believe that people come into life existing in the same condition as Adam and Eve before the fall. The rebellion of humanity's first parents has no effect on their heirs. As such, humanity enjoys the same freedom that existed in the garden. There is no inherited tendency, bent, proclivity, or enslavement to sin. People are free to choose to follow God or not. Obedience to God's law is within every person's power. Free will enables everyone to overcome all temptations. So that's his summary of Pelagianism. Very good summary. And like I said, if, if you're in a discussion with someone, this is a good discussion to have. 
the simple question. So when Adam and Eve fell, what effect did that have on us? Okay. Are we as free as Adam and Eve or did something change about us? Are we different than Adam and Eve were before they fell? And if so, what? And if, if the person says, no, there's no difference. Well, that, that has a huge trajectory of what direction they're going to go in their understanding of this topic. Now, we're, we fired up the book cam. If you've been a listener for a while, I haven't, I haven't fired up the book cam for a while. So this is where this is going to take a little more time, but I think it's worth the time. And this is something that people just don't do anymore. Uh, this is what you would do in Bible college or seminary, is we're going to actually read the original sources here. And we're going to read some extracts from Pelagius himself, just to hear it from the horse's mouth. Okay, so I have this book here. It's actually, the binding's falling apart, but it's a, it's a paperback. So this is, this is what we used in, in seminary, Trinity School for Ministry. Oh, let me go to full screen here so you can see this if you're watching. So Alistair McGrath, um, Justin Terry, I think he's over at Oxford now teaching. He was the dean president, taught systematic theology. So this is Alistair McGrath, the Christian theology reader, and it's a companion book to Alistair McGrath's Christian theology. And this is not, this is more historical theology is what it would be called, not systematic theology. But I am so thankful that the systematic theology was taught at the time at Trinity School for Ministry when I got my master's degree as more of a historical theology, because I was already devouring systematic theologies. And I had systematic theology pretty much, you know, the basic ideas of it. But Studying theology historically, meaning how did these doctrines work out through church history, which is how he arranges his. Now, th and this is the reader. So basically, this is just a ton of original sources that is referenced in the main textbook. And you can go here and actually read the chunks of it. So what we're going to read here is some stuff from Pelagius. Okay. So let's get the book cams fired up. Going to switch to it. So if you're watching, you'll be able to see the book on the screen if, if you're into that thing. I mean, it's, I think most people don't really care, but some of you may. So yeah, that looks pretty good. I can see it. I'm sure you can see it there. All right. So Pelagius on human responsibility. So we got a couple sources, and this is what Christopher quotes um, as a citation for that first paragraph when he describes Pelagianism. So Let's read McGrath's little editorial comment. Um, in this letter written to Demetrius, a Roman woman of high social status, who eventually became a nun, Pelagius argues that the divine commands are unconditionally binding upon Christians. God knows the abilities of humanity, and the commands reflect the ability with which God endowed, hum endowed humanity at creation. There is no defect in human nature which prevents them from achieving what God commands people to do. Okay? Okay. So here's a letter that Pelagius wrote to someone called Demetrius, a woman, Roman woman, and it's extant. It, it's preserved. We have it. Okay, so let's read this. So I'm just going to read it and not make too many comments. We'll just read it and, uh, you know, we're looking at some of these original sources. Okay, so here's Pelagius talking or writing. Instead of regarding God's command as a privilege, we cry out at God and say, this is too hard. This is too difficult. We cannot do it. We are only human and hindered by the weakness of the flesh. Yeah, that's the quote. So that's what Pelagius is kind of mocking that. Like we, we cry out to God and act like the commands are too hard and we can't do it. Okay. So he's, he's quoting that. Now here's Pelagius' response to that. What blind madness. What blatant presumption. By doing this, we accuse the God of knowledge of a twofold ignorance. Ignorance of God's own creation and of God's own commands. It would be as if, forgetting the weakness of humanity, God's own creation, God had laid upon us commands which we were unable to bear. And at the same time, may God forgive us. We ascribe to the righteous one unrighteousness and cruelty to the Holy One, first by complaining that God has commanded the impossible, second by imagining that some will be condemned by God for what they could not help, so that the blasphemy of it, God is thought of as seeking our punishment rather than our salvation. No one knows the extent of our strength better than the God who gave us that strength. God is not willed to command anything impossible, for God is righteous, and will not condemn anyone for what they could not help, for God is holy. Interesting, right? And then we have an editorial comment by McGrath. But see, see Pelagius' basic, basic framework there? 
he's saying that if your position is that we are born sinful, unable to keep God's commands, that is a stain on the character of God. Why? Because when God commands us to do something, if we're unable to do it, that that dishonors God. God's ign- what is God ignorant? He doesn't know that when he commands us to do something, we're unable to do it. Isn't that cruel of God to command us something we're unable to do? Right? It's interesting. And this is where the this is where the issue was between Pelagius and Augustine. Because Augustine would say, Well, God does this to show us our weakness and cause us to cry out for grace, for God's power. And Pelagius seems that he would have none of that. No, we don't need God's grace to do what God commands. We have the innate ability to do it because God created us with that ability. So see, um, just as Christopher was saying, the issue in Pelagianism is there is no impact of Adam and Eve's sin upon their children. We are unaffected by it. So Alistair McGrath, little comment here he makes, the fundamental point being made by Pelagius is this. God made humanity and is therefore fully apprised of human capacities. It is therefore inconceivable that God would ask anything of humanity unless humanity already had the capacity to achieve it. For Augustine, however, the commands serve the purpose of disclosing the human inability to keep the law of God without divine grace. All right. Then we have some questions for study. Might as well read these. Uh, question one, no one knows the extent of our strength better than the God who gave us that strength. Locate this passage within the text. What does Pelagius mean by this? Number two, how does Pelagius estimate the human capacity to fulfill the law? Well, we already answered that. He, he, he estimates that is unlimited. All right. So now we have another, um, extract from Pelagius. Okay. So let's read what McGrath says editorially about the passage before we read it. This extract is taken from what remains of an otherwise lost writing of Pelagius, which is cited by Augustine in order to criticize Pelagius' views. For this reason, it cannot be regarded as totally reliable. It may have been cited out of context, for example. So, so we only have this writing of Pelagius because Augustine preserved it. And it is true that history is written by the victors, right? <laughs> that is true. The Pelagian idea, to which Augustine takes particular exception... Is that humanity? Let me fix the book cam a little bit. There we go. Uh, there we go. The Pelagian idea, which Augustine takes particular exception, is that humanity can exist without sin. However, he also criticizes Pelagius for ascribing the will to perform good works to human nature. For Augustine, such a will can only be a divine gift, in that fallen human nature inclines to do evil rather than good. So remember, this is one of the issues. Augustine pressed hard that the fall of Adam inclined human nature to evil. So you're born with that inclination. Pelagius denied this. Okay, so let's read this extract here from Pelagius coming through Augustine. We have to note that as as, uh, McGrath did. Okay, here's Pelagius. We distinguish three things and arrange them in a certain order. We put in the first place possibility, posse, which is in the Latin there. In the second, will, vele. In the third, being, essay. The passe we assign to nature, the vele to will, and the essay to actual realization. The first of these passe is probably described to God, who conferred it on his creatures. While the other two, vele and essay, are to be referred to the human agent, since they have their sources in the divine will. Therefore, human praise lies in being willing and in doing a good work, or rather, this praise belongs to humanity and to the God who has granted the possibility of willing and working, and who by the help of grace assists exactly this possibility. The fact that someone has this possibility of willing and doing any good work is due to God alone. Therefore, this must be often repeated because of your foolishness. When we say that it is possible for someone to be without sin, we are even then praising God by acknowledging the gift of possibility which we have received. It is God who has bestowed this passe on us, and there is no occasion for praising the human agent when we are treating of God alone. For the question is not about vele or essay, but solely about what is possible. Interesting, right? So this is Augustine writing, and he is... He is, um, not, let's see, that's, that's what I don't understand. I don't understand if that's a Pelagius talk. Let's see if McGrath, yeah, McGrath gives us a little, uh, comment on this. Let's see if he shed some light on that. This extract taken from Pelagius' lost writing, pro libro arbit, arbitra, arbitrio, 
for the free will. In this work, Pelagius argues that God has endowed human beings with certain abilities, for example, the ability to avoid sin. When someone avoids sin, therefore, Pelagius argues, praise and thanks are due to God for having given such an ability to the one who has merely exercised rather than achieved or created such a talent. Note especially Pelagius' assumption that human nature as we now know it is more or less the same as when God originally created it, an idea which Augustine opposed, believing that the fall had radically distorted and weakened the original state of humanity. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so what Pelagius is saying there basically is keeping God's commands doesn't give us credit. We're just doing what God made us able to do. So it's not boasting. It's just God said, do it. We're able to do it. Then we can do it. But it's, it comes down to the same thing, right? Um, and then Pelagius, this, and, and this is something we need to study further, um, the passe vele esse, to be able to wish and to be, has a relationship help him make his points. The praise belongs to both humanity and to God who has granted the possibility of willing and working. Look at this passage in the text. What does Pelagius mean by this? Okay. So then we have one more extract of Pelagius here. Pelagius's rejection of original sin. All right, we're at 25 minutes. So th yeah, we're, this is going to be a multi-part thing. But I think it's, it's well worth the time. Because if, if, if the only education you're getting on this is just watching Calvinists and provisionists debate each other and watching YouTube videos of people going back and forth, uh, you're not going to get this deep, right? The, just the, the social media is designed to not get this deep with things. So Pelagius' rejection of original sin. Okay, here's McGrath. This passage, taken from a lost writing of Pelagius, is cited in a work of Augustine who quotes it in order to discredit it. Note the distinctive Pelagian idea that humanity is born with a capacity for good or evil rather than intrinsically evil. For Augustine, original sin contaminates humanity from the moment of conception so that humanity is born sinful, right? So see, there's the big difference again between Augustine and Pelagius. So here's, here's Pelagius being quoted by Augustine. Everything, he says, good and evil, concerning which we are either worthy of praise or of blame, is done by us, not born with us. <coughs> I'm not going to try to quote the Latin there. We are not born in our full development, but with a capacity for good and evil. We are begotten without virtue as much as without fault. And before the activity of the individual will there is nothing in humans other than what god has placed in them see so there it's just a straight denial of original sin that there is any proclivity toward that from birth and then mcgrath quotes again he, mcgrath gives a comment this is an important passage in that it casts light on pelagius's understanding of human nature basically pelagius argues that god endows humanity with certain capacities and abilities it is then up to the individual human beings to use these abilities appropriately they may use them for good or evil, but Pelagius is clear that they are intended to be used for good and that when rightly used, they will achieve the good goals which God purposed. And then the next is the Council of Carthage, which we will get into the church councils on Pelagianism a little later. So I hope that was, was helpful. Uh, let's go back to the essay now. So we're at 27 minutes. All right, real talk, I got a whole bunch of housework to do before I go off to my son's or my daughter's basketball game. Anyway, all right. So I need to I actually need to cut this a little shorter than I wanted to, but it's fine. It's, we could just get a start, dip our toe in, and then keep going. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, because the next thing we're going to actually read, we're going to read Philip Schaff on Pelagianism at the Council of Ephesus, and we're going to look at that. It'll be an interesting read, a little church history as well. All right. So here, this is a continuing. We'll finish the, the description of Pelagianism. Yeah, we should be able to do that. Okay. So this is back to Christopher's uh, journal article. He says, More specifically, humanity achieves salvation by following the example and teaching of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect model of how a person is to live. Through obedience to Christ's instruction, individuals earn their salvation. Because humanity is not plagued in any way by original sin, they can live their lives according to Christ's precepts. All can live out the two greatest commandments given by Jesus. There are no excuses for failure. Ultimately, when people stand in final judgment, God will decide their eternal fate based on how well they have followed Christ. Therefore, human action is the means of salvation. All right, so this is the most extreme version 
of the spectrum that we have up here is Pelagianism and it's human monarchism, remember. And let's see, he's got a footnote for that. Christopher A. Hall, Learning Theology with, with the Church Fathers, Downers Grove, Illinois, 2002, page 132 to 53. So that, if you wanted, I didn't chase that one down. Uh, I don't have that book, as far as I re recall, I don't have that book. All right, next section. Since the Third Ecumenical Council at Ephesus in 431 AD, the Universal Church has rejected Pelagianism as heresy. While no Christian denomination or local church officially holds to its tenets, it continues to find expression among clergy and laity in liberal mainline denominations, in religious bodies like Unitarian Universalists and quasi-religious organizations like Freemasonry, and in popular thought throughout much of Western history. Okay? And I, I experienced this one time. This was years and years and years and years and years ago, but I found myself in a mainline Presbyterian USA, PCUSA church. And we were at a Bible study, it's like a Sunday school class, and I was in there with, with a group of people, more older people. And I we got on the topic of Adam and Eve and the fall and sin. And I said something, and I don't even think I was, I was trying to be not like, you know, super zealous Calvinist in there, you know, flipping tables and stuff. But I was like, I, I think I just said something like, well, you know, Adam, we're born sinners because of Adam's sin. And I remember this lady was in there. She's like, I don't believe that. And she was like, she got really like, that's crazy. Babies aren't born sinful. Man, no way. I know there's no way. That is not true at all. And I remember the guy who was running the study like moved on to the next topic because it was, you know, it, it was interesting. So so that's true. This This idea that human beings are born good and then, of course, popular thought throughout much of Western history, oh, you better believe it. I mean, the secular culture we live in, human beings are born good, and they become bad by their environment, which, by the way, um, Pelagianism will acknowledge that Adam and Eve brought death into the external world that we dwell in, but they will not say that that touched the soul or the faculties. But it will say that we're born into a world that's infected by and impacted by sin and death. But it didn't impact us in, in internally, right? And then in Western culture, well, you're born sinless and good and everyone's born innocent and it's the environment that corrupts them, right? That's the. And then if someone does do something, you know, very wicked, well, that's probably due to... Um, that's probably due to, you know, they have a genetic deformity or something. Like serial killers are born that way. You know, it's anyway. Say so final paragraph, and I gotta wrap this up for this for this part. Well, clearly rejected in the Wesleyan tradition, it does not it, it does exist in popular form among members and participants in Wesleyan congregations. Ignorantly or uncritically, some think good works, church attendance, church membership, financial contributions to the church, charitable giving, acts of obedience, and doing good, etc., earn a person a place in God's kingdom. Similarly, others believe that their good and bad deeds will be weighed in the balances and final judgment, and that if their good works outweigh their bad, heaven will be their reward. Oh, yeah. That's not just in Wesleyanism. That's in all major denominations, all major forms of Christianity, and your average person on the street who grew up in a Christian culture or Christian nation, right? Well, no, you know, my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds. If you've ever done street evangelism, why would God let you into heaven? Well, because what's the classic answer? Well, because I try to be a good person. You know, I'm trying to do the right thing. God knows my heart. You know, I've done some, I've made some mistakes, but I've done more good than bad. So God's certainly going to accept that, right? That's usually the answer that you get. All right, so next time we will, uh, to continue the study of Pel the Pelagian angle, uh, that part of the spectrum, we will read some from Philip Schaff, and we will look at the Council of Ephesus, and we will look at some statements there, and then we're going to go to semi-Pelagianism will be the next uh, topic that he's going to cover. So, you know, we got through a little bit today, but it's good to just, you know, so just, just re-review this. Uh, we learned about Pelagianism. We'll learn a little more about it next time in the church history perspective and how the universal church dealt with uh, the undivided universal church back in the, uh, you know, patristic era, how they dealt with this issue. And we'll go from there. So thank you for tuning into another episode of Apologetics from the Attic. 
and I'm excited to continue to do the study with you. Uh, subscribe, like, share. We're going to continue our Roman study. I want to get my systematic theology study going again, and I want to um, <clears throat> go back to looking at some of the stuff with the Thomistic stuff and uh, the Matthew Barrett stuff and all that, and I got some stuff I want to review on that too. So st subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of that stuff. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcast platform that you have. We're on most of them, Apple Spotify, um, Google Podcasts, we're on a lot of them. So thank you, and God bless. <laughs>